Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Murnau. Ten years ago, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program was established and provided those who came to the United States as children an opportunity to gain protection from deportation. For those who met the requirements for the program and could afford to apply, DACA provided authorization to work and opportunities for higher paying jobs. Many DACA recipients have said that the program helped them work and find better paying jobs, attend college, and buy a home. According to data from the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, over 643,500 people were in the program as of March of this year. Joining us now to share more about how the DACA program has impacted her life is Brenda Martinez. Brenda also works as an HR and operations manager with the faith-based community organizing group, New Mexico Cafe. Brenda, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. So let's start off with uh, how old were you when you first found out uh, about the DACA program and can you kind of share with us about how the process was by getting into the program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I had recently graduated from um, high school actually my first semester in college um, so I was about 17 years old and the process at first was obviously very exciting you know to have an opportunity because I knew I wanted to go to college but I knew that I didn't have a legal status so I didn't know what my future would look like you know like I knew I wanted to go to college but what would happen after so this was a great um, hope for me but it was also scary because um, you know in, in the process you have to disclose a lot of information about your family your status where you come from and so it was a combination of emotions of you know like being scared but also excited um, also worried about you know where do I get the money at the time my mom was a, a single mother of three and so she was the only one working and um, you know, also worrying about where, where do I get the funds to apply for it? But like I said, a mix of emotions. <laughs> now you mentioned funds. I mean, how much does it really cost to even apply? Right. So the application itself is around $500. But obviously, being the first time applying, you also want to get legal advice, right? And so I think that's where uh, the it's more expensive. Um, and I feel that a lot of attorneys tend to take advantage of you know people like or situations like that and they tend to now that i know more about the program and that i've renewed it myself and helped others apply for it um you know at any at no cost it's like i knew that they were taking advantage of me at that time because they can charge you thousands of dollars um to help you with the application so what was that moment like when you found out that you were approved for daca and you were able to uh, legally Find, find a job or, or pursue college and have access to certain opportunities. Can you kind yes. of share with us what that feeling was like and, and what the program opened up for you? Yeah, absolutely. So it was a definitely a feeling of big relief and excitement, right? Um, but at the same time, like I mentioned, I have a brother and a sister and, and like they didn't get it at that time. And so it, it was really exciting. I was very happy for myself but at the same time I felt kind of guilty because like I couldn't share that emotion with them because although they were happy for me I'm not saying that they weren't they were very happy for me and my mom was too but it was only me getting the uh, benefit from it if that makes sense yeah I want to talk about that a little bit more mm -hmm. because uh, there's there's so many folks not only in our community but across the country who live in mixed status homes Right. And uh, and things like that were ha would, were happening. So um, I think it's really you know a great opportunity for us to learn a little bit from you and gain some insight about as things were opening up. Um, you know what were some advantages that you immediately saw 
and took advantage of yeah. and it, can you care and kind of share that with us yeah of course so obviously the biggest one was to be able to have an actual job you know where um where it doesn't have to be in the fields like picking up pecans or in the onion sheds or you know the, the more labor uh, jobs um i remember my first job was at a restaurant as a waitress and so that allowed me to you know be able to go into the actual workforce and find a job. At that time, I was still in college, so that's kind of where I went. But then after that, um, I was able to work at a bank and then at another nonprofit organization doing human resource resource management because that's my my degree. And then I ended up in an M Cafe, as you mentioned. Uh, but aside from employment opportunities, I think DACA gave me the opportunity to build my credit, to travel within the United States. Um, you know that we're in a city where we're surrounded by checkpoints. So um, before DACA, it was impossible for me to go past, you know, White Sands or um, I couldn't go anywhere else. So that gave me the opportunity to travel in no other cities. Uh, like I said, I was able to purchase my my first car, my first home. It, it's just a, a complete change that I think it's hard to for people to understand if they're not in that situation, because I think a, a lot of those things are take it for, taken for granted for someone that's born in the U.S., right? Or simply has a social to be able to work. Um, I think without DACA, I wouldn't have, I would probably have done it because you know my mom has always taught me like never give up you know always work hard until you get your reach your dreams but i think it would have been way harder and some of the things i wouldn't have been able to accomplish like for example travel or like build my credit because you need a social for that and well without a credit you can't really do any of the other stuff so yeah that, you bring up uh, an interesting point but i even before you got daca you brought up something that i don't think a lot of people realize uh, who who it's not affected who aren't affected by it and that is living in an area where there are border checkpoints around right. and if you don't have legal status that really limits your travel within this area exactly. what was it like growing up uh as a as a young person here in this region and not being able to do things like maybe go on a field trip mm -hmm. or, or visit different places uh, around the area where you know you only heard about them or learned about them uh, through the internet or television. So it's like, what are your, what was that like, that experience like? And young people are still experiencing that today. Correct. So could yes. you kind of give us some insight on that? Yeah, absolutely. So it was always, um like I was always having to hide my status and then coming up with excuses like with the little kids, right? Like for example, back when I was in elementary, they would take us to White Sands and obviously like I couldn't go because you have to cross the checkpoint. Um, and it's like, how do I explain to them, <laughs> you know, the situation and the reason why I can't go without them like judging me or like looking at me weird and because we're kids right like at that age you don't understand uh, why because it's very easy for people to say well why don't you fix your status right like why did you come here illegally and so it's uh it's very easy for someone because even like growing up like as an adult having daca like people were like well why don't you just get your green card <laughs> and it's like it's hard to explain to people like the actual long process and like the limited options that we have to become a U.S. citizen. Um, so yeah, I think back to your question, it, it was like always constantly trying to hide and try, having to make up things like uh, as to why you couldn't do certain things without trying to cover that you were illegal so that people wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah. That, that feeling though, I mean, and then having to continue with it through a, a very trying time. I mean, growing up like that, and, and then as a young person, you know, in high school, junior high and high school, those are very insecure times. So, right. I mean, how did that affect you as well with your like your mental health going through things like mm -hmm. that? You know, I think at that time, uh, mental health wasn't a thing for me, especially like growing up in a Hispanic family. Like, you don't talk about mental health, right? I think it, I came to realize that right now as an adult, now that I'm able to have insurance and go to therapy and it's like, it's all those little things that really impacted my life, right? Um, 
but at the time you don't know like you don't know why you feel a certain way or why you just think that it's part of life but then you go back and look at it and it's like well that really impacted me because I was always trying to hide I was always limited from opportunities that other classmates had uh, for example when I graduated high school I graduated top 10% of my, my class I was number eight and I remember perfectly fine that everyone in that list on the graduating book had you know next to their name like large amounts of dollars from scholarships that they were getting and my name didn't have anything because I didn't have a status right and so um, at that time I'm like okay whatever that's fine that's normal I'm, I'm okay with it but then later on I'm like no that was not okay because I worked hard you know to to have good grades and to go to college and for them to limit my my future and my opportunities to go to college with a full paid scholarship you know wasn't fair for a 16 year old 17 year old to understand that you know uh, but like I said that's something that you don't talk about when you're growing up especially in a Hispanic um, culture um, it's more so now as an adult that I'm understanding you know those uh, hardships that I went through mm. now we do have an update with your status uh, <laughs> you recently gained access to a green card yes. what was that experience <laughs> like finally having that uh, you know freedom that and knowing that you're uh, legally able to be here yeah it's it's still surreal to me to be completely honest with you um, I've been in this country since I was seven years old and I hadn't been able to go back to my ho home country um, the only way that I was able to obtain my green card was through marriage and so growing up you know I've, I had been with my my partner for nine years and they would always tell me like oh get married so that he can give you the green card and I'm like no like to me like in my beliefs and my values like that was not the reason why I was going to get married so you know it, it was God's plan he was the one and we got married in 2020 and then we started the process and now I, I got it because of that but the reason why I mentioned that is because there's a lot of um, there's just a very negative narrative about people getting married to US citizens just to get a green card and so I just want to make it clear that that was not my case I've been with my partner for nine years already and we just recently got married but um, the experience I'm still like trying to digest it because it's very surreal to me like when I got the it was a full process right like when I when I got when I went to my interview like and they told me that it would be approved the next day that was like I can put into words like the feeling that I had um a lot of things crossed my mind at that point um What's, what things so one of them was my grandmother who passed away in 2017 uh the reason why my process was so so <clears throat> easy to to get my green card was because in 2017 when my grandmother passed away i requested what we call advanced parole through daca and um so that i could go to her funeral and i remember that the officer the uscia officer that gave me the the advance parole told me you know this is the last gift that your grandmother left you and at that point i was like thankful you know for the opportunity to go and say my last goodbyes but later on i thought about it and i'm like no like that's not the gift that i wanted from her you know like i wanted to get a hug from her on my birthday i wanted to you know spend Christmas with her or like I don't think seeing your grandmother in a casket should be a gift you know what I mean so fast forward five years later when I'm sitting at the interview and you know they tell me like it's approved and everything I was very happy but that at the same time I would remember my grandmother tell me whenever we would call her when we were small you know um hey, like, when are you coming back, mija? Like, you know, and, and I would I would say one day, grandma, one day I'll go back and she would tell me, you're gonna come back when I'm, you know, when when I pass away. And unfortunately that was true. But um, besides that, like the feeling was 
I was just, I'm just so thankful, you know, thankful with like the opportunity to be able to go back after 20 years. Um, it just seems surreal to me. Like I, I went to, to Mexico to, to visit my family and it was just, I, I still can't process the fact that I can come and go whenever I want to. And it, yeah. it's like, I've been waiting for this for so long. Yeah. Um, I remember when I got the card in the mail, it was a Friday night. And I remember she just staring at it for a long time. And my husband was like, I don't remember what he was telling me. He's like, hey, hey, are you okay? And I'm, I was just like in a shock moment where I couldn't, I was just, I felt like, in the clouds for a long time. Like, I guess I went into a shock moment because it's really hard, I think, to, for, because even my husband, like, he doesn't understand my feeling, right? Because he he was born here in the U.S., so he he doesn't, I, I don't think, I think you have to be, you really have to live through it to really completely understand it. Um, the feeling of, like, gratitude that you feel when, when you finally get that document that can change your life forever. Wow. So, when when you uh, well, first of all, I mean, I'm I'm sorry to hear that that you had to go through that and experience that, and congratulations on you know the marriage and accessing the green card, but I I can't help but think so many years in DACA, right, and not having a fix for immigration in mm -hmm. this country to address right. issues that affect folks like you, young right. people like you, many of people exactly. of all ages. How was that feeling when you don't know what your future is going to be like, but you still want to pursue better things for yourself and your loved ones? <clears throat> well, it's really uh, like very uncertain, right? I, I, I think life itself can be uncertain sometimes, right? But for us, like not having a, a status, it's like for sure you know that there's nothing ahead of you right like you want to like for example me I always had in my mind that I wanted to go to college and that I wanted to graduate I didn't know how I was going to do it and it was really frustrating because I'm a person that likes to plan ahead and that you know be prepared for anything that can happen but even with DACA like even when it was approved it was really hard to do that because it was always at stake right like um, they would always like take it off for a while and then it's back on and then we're gonna cancel new applications and then we're just gonna close it all together. And so it's always that feeling of uncertainty and uh, fear that you don't really know if tomorrow they're gonna come and get you because they have your information, you know? And so um, it's always living like with that fear. Like you're never 100% like sure that you're gonna be, you know, safe in this country what are your hopes for DACA you know to continue on in the form that it is in right now um I really hope that you know even though I have my green card now that doesn't I'm always going to be a dreamer um and I'm always gonna fight and advocate for for my brothers and sisters that are still you know in that situation um I want them to to open the program again and give the opportunity to everyone like I had it to at least have a working permit, you know, um, because that itself impacts you, even though you can't travel to to Mexico with, with that or to whatever your your foreign country, your country of birth is, sorry. Yeah. Um, it, it still makes a huge difference because it, it opens a lot of opportunities, you know, starting um, with being able to work in the US. And so my hope is for them to open the program again to those who couldn't apply. There's a lot of applications that are kind of in limbo right now that they submitted the applications and then when they, um, when the judge in Texas kind of put a stop in it, like they're still there pending, right? So my hope is for them to open the program again and, and give that opportunity to the million other dreamers that are out there. Yeah, you're you're referring to a moment where there there was an opportunity after um, the for doc, for people to apply for DACA recently in recent years. Yes. But then the judge in Texas, uh, you know, um, changed that yes. with, with his ruling, and so um, now we're going to find out what happens with this case in New York. Right. In the meantime, around 
80,000, I believe, yes. uh, recipients are in limbo waiting to know if they're going to be able to enter the program or not. Correct. So this thing, what's going on right now, I mean, it, DACA has provided an opportunity for hundreds of thousands of people, mm -hmm. uh, but there's also a lot of younger people who are eligible to mm -hmm. get into the program and are in limbo like this. Yes. Can you kind of share with us what it's like for them to be waiting for so long to get into the program and then finally they think they have a chance but now they're in limbo. Right and I can tell you that from her first hand experience too because that's exactly what happened to my brother and sister. They ha they're younger than me and so the first time that uh, it was available again my mom and I couldn't afford it right again because she was a single mom. I had I don't think I was yeah I, w I started working but it was just hard and so we didn't have the money then when we finally had it um we had an appointment with an attorney and then the next day they closed it so then that was that and then the next time that we we were able to you know afford it they sent the application they went for fingerprints and everything was like super exciting i remember my brother was still 20 and i told him by the time you're 21 we're gonna go on a trip to a beach and you know celebrate your birthday over there and um that was the hope but then again in july they closed it again and like i said they had already gone to their fingerprints and all they were waiting for is really the approval and the card to get um to get to them so it's really a lot of frustration and a feeling of like unfairness because like they they met all the requirements right we send the packet they the they have a clean record and it's like my sister graduated from NMSU actually with a certificate in um, dental assisting. And so she can't pursue her career, right? Because she doesn't have the document to do so. So it's a lot of frustration and sometimes you get mad. Sometimes you, you just keep hope and a lot of mixed emotions. Now, we just have a few minutes left, but I, I, I wanna talk with you a little about, about uh, the pandemic and how it's affected uh, many different communities it mm -hmm. affected you know the entire country and state uh, yes. uh, and but there were folks who couldn't access federal relief because yes. of their legal status exactly. um, now how do you think this really impacted uh, folks uh, in our region who couldn't access those benefits I mean I think our region you know being a border community uh, has a lot of Hispanic and undocumented people that were not able to access those funds and if you think about it, those our communities, like our marginalized communities, are the ones that really need those funds. And so it was really frustrating uh, to me, like working in this field, for example, when we had the rental relief, that hearing that the they had to send the money back because they didn't know who to give it to. And I'm like, the need is there. Like, just make the process and the requirements easy, like make it accessible for the people that really need it, right? And so I know there's a lot of people out there that, that didn't have the opportunity to benefit from those um, stimulus. Now, how do you think with the DACA program and the opportunities it provided to you, um, you were able to do so much with it, mm -hmm. but how do you think that ripple effect uh, happened around your family and your loved ones when you were able to do those things? Yeah, so even though I'm the only one with like some sort of, you know, legal status, I feel like it helped. I was able to help my family, you know, even though it was very limited. For example, the house, like I was able to buy it under my credit. Uh, if they needed help with like buying a car themselves and stuff like that, I, I would able I would be able to, to do so with with my documentation so now you were working in the private industry uh, mm -hmm. dealing with mortgages helping people find their american dream of buying a house yes. uh <laughs> doing very well for yourself mm -hmm. uh you had this opportunity to perhaps pursue these uh wonderful opportunities that may have had an increase in pay and uh, grow in the private sector why did you choose to go into uh, working in community organizing <laughs> That's a great question, and I think the the answer is pretty easy. Um, this is like I'm working for my people, you know. I'm giving a voice to, because I I was at one point a person without a voice. I was a person that was 
taught by the system to be quiet. And so when I, when I learned about cafe and when I started getting involved, I made sure that people heard my voice and, and that's what I want to be to, to my community. Um, and I wouldn't change it for anything. <laughs> We're in an election year and there are people who are running for political office who have used really strong rhetoric when it comes to immigration and border security. Mm -hmm. uh, rhetoric that some people may find offensive. Yes. Uh, what are your concerns with this and the language that's being used as we move into and get closer to this election? I think that's the work we continue to do, right, is to change that narrative. Um, and the, the way that we do that is by sharing our stories and really letting people know that we're just here to work and, and that those things are not true. I mean, um, every, every, everyone has people that can be rapists, that can steal, or, you know, it doesn't mean that just Hispanic people are like that. So I think that's that's kind of like our job is to really make it clear through our stories and through our actions that that's not what we're here for. And that, um, you know, to really change that narrative that the system has created. All right, well, Brenda Martinez with New Mexico Cafe, I wanna thank you so much for being with us and sharing your story with us on the program. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> And we want to thank you for joining us for another episode of Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Myrtle. We'll see you next time.